Okay, I think we are live. Hopefully people can hear the broadcast okay at this point. We'll start in just a few seconds. Looks like the voice is working, which is good. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. Welcome to the 10th live lecture and virtual office hour for the POSA communications MOOC. What we'll be doing today in the next hour is going through my solution to assignment number three. And naturally, I'll be more than happy to take any questions that you might have during that time. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, and start the uh, discussion. Let me first share my screen so everybody can see what I've been working on. Okay, so hopefully you can see the, the screen that's here. Let me make sure it comes up before I go any further, just uh, as a sanity check. All right, I think... Yep, it's showing up, good. So what I'd like to do this morning is talk about my solution to programming assignment number three. Here's the source code. Keep in mind, of course, during this discussion that there's no requirement that your solution look exactly like mine as long as it addresses the various requirements that are summarized here in the uh, programming assignment description and uh, fulfills the rubric criteria that are in the peer evaluation site. Here's the manifest file real quick. This looks an awful lot like the manifest file for the acronym application. It's pretty much the same structure. We have a main activity and we have something called a display weather activity, which I'll talk about in a second. If you watch the video that I put showing how the my assignment, my assignment solution actually works, you'll see how the display weather activity behaves. And then we have a pair of services, Weather Service Async and Weather Service Sync. And you can see that they both run in the same background process. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about the cache later. Of course, we have two services because we want to demonstrate different ways of doing uh, services using asynchronous and synchronous processing. Let's go take a look now at the source code. So this is organized, again, very similarly to the way in which the source code is organized in the acronym application. Before I dive into the details, I'll first give you a high-level overview of this. We have uh, the activities directory, and that contains the user-facing operations in the program for getting input and producing the weather data in a nice format to output to the user. We have the AIDL interfaces, which define how the client talks to the local server. And including in this is also a weather data object that's essentially a, a POJO that we use to pass back and forth between the client and the local service. We then have the JSON weather format, and this is for talking from the local service to the remote service, to the web service, the open web service, web, uh, open weather service web service. And this really defines the, the data model for communicating with the open weather service, web service, web, weather service, too many services here. And there's also, as you can see, a parser for how to parse the results. We then have the client side operations, which are interacted with via the activity in order to communicate with the local service. So this is kind of the business logic on the client side. And then we have the services. And this is kind of the business logic on the local server side or the service side on the phone. And the purpose of these, these classes is largely to interact with the web server and to be able to shield the application from the details of all that. And then finally, we have utilities. And utilities are basically a bunch of clever little classes I developed to do various things like be able to connect to a service with bind service, be able to uh, have a, a clever cache, 
to be able to retain state when we rotate the phone, to be able to do uh, something called a generic singleton, and we'll talk about those things as we go through the implementation. Okay, so that's the high-level view. Let's now go ahead and kind of dive down more into the details. Here's main activity. This is uh, sort of the latest thinking I've come to about how to define activities and what goes where. So basically, the activity contains the retained fragment manager, so it'll handle rotations cleanly. It has a weather ops object that is the basically the client side business logic. It's got a field where the user enters the weather location. And uh, let's see, let's clean that up real quick. Then it's got the on create hook method, which gets called back when we're starting up. That goes goes ahead and sets the content view. It goes ahead and connects the the view for the edit text with the one defined in the resources file, and it handles any configuration change. If you rotate the phone, we'll look at that in a second. Here's the on destroy method. This is what's going to talk to the weather ops object to unbind the service when the the object is destroyed. And you'll see that we have a clever implementation in this, which we'll look at shortly. That doesn't actually tear the service down if we're just rotating the phone, but will tear down the binding to the service if this uh, activity is actually going away or if it's being blocked by something else. So this means that the service will run uh, as long as the activity is around and, and active. Here's handle configuration changes. We use the retain fragment manager as always to check if it's the first time in. If it is, we create a new weather ops implementation object so we can have a way of interfacing the client to the client side business logic. We stick that into the retained fragment manager so its state will live around even when the rotations occur. And then we go ahead and bind to the service. If this is not the first time in, that means that a rotation has occurred. So we try to fish out the weather ops from the retained fragment manager. And if we don't get it for some reason, which is pretty weird, then we go ahead and recreate it and bind it again. But normally we would we would fish it out of the retained fragment manager, and then we would go ahead and call the on configuration change hook method on the weather ops object, so it'll go ahead and and reconnect and, and update the activity reference. Here are the basic ways of the user can interact with the system by entering by clicking the get weather sync or get weather async buttons on the user interface. And what they do is they grab the string that the user entered, which is the location, hide the keyboard, and then they use the weather ops object to go ahead and invoke a call that will ultimately end up going to the service. And it'll either be resolved in the cache or it'll end up going to the weather service web service. And basically, async and sync work essentially the same way. They just call different methods. When everything is done and we've got results back. Uh, or even if we don't get the proper results back, whatever things are done, then the display results method is going to get called back. And we'll see where that gets called. That gets called back in inside of uh, the weather ops class. And it does a little sanity checking to see if it got back valid data. If not, it goes ahead and prints a toast, informing the user that something went wrong. Otherwise, we go ahead and get an intent for the display weather activity. And you'll see, notice what we're passing in here when we call make intent. We're actually passing in the array list of weather data. This is what had, has come back from the local service that we've bound to. And uh, you'll see how we use this in a second. It's very clever. Then we go to check to make sure that we actually have this intent registered with an activity. And if so, we start the activity. And if not, we display a toast. Now, the activity itself is, is a separate entity. And we do this primarily to allow it to be reused for other projects later. We can reuse the same way of displaying weather data independent of whether we use a bound service or something else, like a, a started service or just an async task or whatever. We don't care. Um, the display weather activity is a, a reusable asset. This is pretty cool. You'll, you'll see more about how it works in a second. But basically, we have an intent that can be used to start it as an implicit uh, intent. We keep track of the type, which is a parsable weather object. We have a key that we use to keep track of the, uh, the data that's passed in here. And then we've got a, bunch of, a whole bunch of fields for all the different 
information we want to be able to display to the user. Things like the, the current day, the location, the temperature and Celsius and Fahrenheit, the sunrise, the sunset, the wind, the humidity, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all the things that we can display with uh, the data that comes back from the weather service. Here's the make intent method. This is kind of cool. It takes in an array list of weather data. And we make a new intent that's an action display weather intent. And we set the type to be the weather type. And then we go ahead and we insert this array list of weather data into the intent as a parcelable array list extra with this key. And that way we can basically pass around uh, a, an array list of weather data between activities. So that's really cool. We've got the parsable mechanism already working. So that allows us to be able to pass these things around as, as first class objects in the type system. Here's the on create method. It sets up the content view, initializes all the view fields, which basically just involves fishing out all the fields that we see here and storing them locally. We then go ahead and grab the intent that was passed into the activity, and we check to make sure it really is the right type. If so, we extract out the weather array list of weather data from the parcelable array list extra. And then we go ahead and set the view field with the results. And of course, it's going to come back in the first element in the weather list. And this then down here is where we do all the processing of the various fields. So we pass in the weather data. We go ahead and we find out the location name and the country. We update the, the location name. Then we go ahead and set the image resource, which we're going to use. And, and these are all uh, real clever because they set different, different kinds of images based on the kind of weather we're having, whether it's rainy or sunny or cloudy and so on. We set the information about the day of the week and the current date, which are all formatted properly. And uh, some other information about sunrise and sunset, we format that data too and go ahead and update it. And uh, we format the temperature for Celsius and Fahrenheit using some methods from the utils class, and so on and so forth. You can see basically that it just goes ahead and, and updates everything there. So this is just a nice, clever little way of being able to reuse all the logic for creating the data to display. And if you watch the video uh, of my solution, you'll see what it looks like. OK, so that's basically all the activity stuff. Let's now go take a look at the data model for the interactions between the client and the local server on the phone. This, of course, really uh, involves passing around weather data, which is a parcelable. And uh, this is the POJO implementation of weather data. It's got a whole bunch of different fields in it. You can see these are all native Java fields like strings and doubles and longs and so on that represent all the different information that gets passed around. We have a constructor to make weather data out of all those fields. We have another constructor that makes weather data out of something called JSON weather, which is the information that's returned from the web service. And then we've got a whole pile of setters and getters that are used to set and get all these fields in a clean way. We've got a way to create a string from all of this stuff. And um, we don't really use that, but that could be used for debugging purposes and so on. And here, we've got other information needed to write the weather data as a parcel, which is needed for the, the parcelable mechanism that's used with the AIDL compiler-generated stubs and proxies and so on. I gave you all this code, so there shouldn't be anything really surprising there. Here is the weather data interfaces. We have the two-way interface called weather call. And you can see weather call has a method called get current weather that takes the, uh, it really takes in the location as a string, and it returns the list of weather data that's associated with that location. We then have the asynchronous versions of this, which have a pair of, of uh, one-way methods. Get current weather takes the location and it also takes a weather results object to get the results back. This is a one-way operation. And then weather results is what's called back by the uh, service after it's done downloading the weather. It goes ahead and will um, 
call back, either passing back the successful results if it downloaded them properly, or it sends back an error message if things went wrong. And so that's how you get error messages back with the, the one-way approach. With the two-way approach, we basically kind of have a little bit of a, of a hack where if you send back a zero-sized list of weather data, that's an indication that something went wrong. There are, of course, other ways to send the data back and forth if you so choose. So that's basically the stuff I gave you. Here's the stuff I, I didn't really give all of it to you, but I gave you some of it. This is by far the most tedious aspects of all this stuff. It's very boring and um, and it's just clearly something that could be improved upon by using a higher level tool like Retrofit or Jackson, which is exactly what you'll do in the next MOOC. But let's talk about how we do it here. So uh, the weather, open the open weather service API defines a bunch of different JSON types. And so we define essentially POJOs for those different types. There's something called main, which represents temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, and I didn't come up with these crazy names. They came up with them. I'm not quite sure why it's called main, but that's what it is. So we basically define a bunch of tags that correspond to the JSON. We define a bunch of fields that correspond to the JSON tags. We define a bunch of data members that correspond to those values. And then we have accessor methods to set and get all those fields. There's also something called sys, which provides you with so-called system data, which involves the country and the sunrise and the sunset. Again, I have absolutely no idea why they grouped this stuff together the way they did. That's just the way they do the Open Weather Service API. It's kind of a, a weird API. Um, so that getters and setters for that. There's also something called wind, which tells you how the wind works. Same basic idea. And there's something that's called weather, which gives you yet some other information um, about all this stuff. So this is basically the, this is the, these are the POJO representations of the information that comes out in JSON. We then have JSON weather, which basically kind of puts all the other pieces together. So you can see JSON weather contains sys and main and wind, and it has a list of weather. Uh, and then it has some other fields as well that are going to be downloaded that involve um, things like the, the COD, which uh, can be used to find out whether the operation succeeded or failed, a message that gets passed back if an error occurs, other kinds of things. And um, this basically has a constructor that takes all those various other elements and creates a JSON weather object. And then there's a bunch of setters and getters to set things as, as we see fit. OK, so those are basically all the POJOs. And here's where it all comes together. This is the JSON weather parser. This is by far the most tedious part of this program. But uh, once you get it working, it, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just tedious. So what we do here is we have a high level method called parse JSON stream, which takes an input stream. And it goes ahead and opens that input, or it um, creates an input stream reader from that input stream and then makes a JSON reader that uses that stream. Now we can go ahead and read this stuff a chunk at a time. We do a little check to see if we've got an array or not, because the Open Weather Service API can return arrays. For what we're doing here, it generally doesn't. So we're probably going to be using this one instead, which gets a single weather datum, single weather data item. And to do this, we make ourselves an array list of JSON weather, and we allocate that. And I think we don't need to put this here because we have Java 7. And then we go ahead and we call a method called parse JSON weather, passing in the reader, and we store the result back in the list. So here is parse JSON weather. And, and all these things look very, very canonical. They all have the same kind of look and feel to them. There's walking through the JSON one element at a time and then turning it into the POJO, appropriate POJO object. So we come in here, we make a JSON weather object. We begin to read the object. And while there's still anything left, we figure out what the name is of the next item in the JSON. And then depending on what the name is, we do a switch. And then that's why we have all those tags in the JSON weather um, class so we can match them. So if we basically get like a message, we go ahead and set the message, which reads the next element as a string. That would be if we get errors, for example. Um, other stuff in here, you know, if we get the main element or a system element or a wind element or a weather element, we end up calling the appropriate 
setter method on the appropriate uh, weather object, and then we recursively call other parse methods to, to read those types of elements. If we see something we don't understand, we just skip it, so it's just ignored, so that's kind of a catch-all. And after we're done parsing a JSON weather object, we come down here and we say reader end object, which basically gets rid of the closing curly brace in the JSON, and we return that. Here's how we parse um, weathers. So this would be a, a, all the weather that would occur. You get a list of weather. So you come in here, we make a, an array list of weather. We begin to read an array, which of course will be the square bracket. And then while there's anything left, we're going to go ahead and parse each of the weather objects and add them into the list. And when we're done, we finish up the, the array and return the list of weather objects. Here's parse weather. So this is going to create a weather object, not a list of it, but a weather object. We parse, we pass in the JSON reader. We make ourselves a weather object. We begin to read the object. And while we haven't finished, we're basically going to read out the field we're expecting here, the description, the icon, the ID, main, and so on and so forth. Um, all this stuff kind of looks the same after a while. And when we're done, we end the object. Here's how we parse main. Same basic idea. We create a main pojo, begin to read. While we're not done, we read each of the elements one at a time and uh, fill in the fields. And you can see, you know, we're, we're reading off the appropriate type each time we find a tag that corresponds to something that we expect. Here's how we parse wind, really nothing different. Here's how we parse sys, again, nothing different. So all these things are basically just tedious, grinding through all the JSON, creating various POJO objects. And then when they're all done, they get returned back appropriately. And as you can see here, uh, what we do is we end up returning a list of JSON weather. And you'll see how that gets used in a little bit. OK, so that's all the JSON stuff. Uh, now let's go take a look at operations. Operations is really the client side business logic. And uh, this is, of course, called by the activity. We have a weather ops interface that defines the operations that we're going to be supporting. So bind service, unbind service, get weather sync, get weather async, and on configuration change. I put a, an interface here just to make it clear at a glance what the real important methods are here. I don't have to do that. I just chose to do it that way. Here's the implementation of that interface. We have our weak reference to our activity because, of course, the activity may get destroyed when rotations occur. We define a couple of generic service connection objects, which greatly reduce the complexity of dealing with the binding to a bound service. We define ourselves a display handler, which we need because we don't want any dependencies on the activity when we're doing the uh, user interface updates because the activity may come and go at inopportune times and we don't want to get messed up with concurrency in that regard. Here's the weather results stub. This is what gets called back by the service after the download has been attempted of the data from the weather, the open uh, weather service API. And um, this is where we're going to use that display handler. If everything goes well, send results gets called back and it gives a, a weather results object. This runs, by the way, in a, in a background thread on the client. And what it does here is it creates a new runnable whose run method will go ahead and call display results. And that will display the weather results to the, it'll, it'll invoke ultimately the display, weather, uh, the, the display weather activity. But this is how we get it back to the, the main activity. Notice how we post this message using the display handler. We do not use run on UI thread because this thing is running in a background thread. And if we call run on UI thread, the activity could get destroyed out from underneath us while that was happening. So we use a handler, which does not have that problem. Here is the send error method. Send error is what we use to get the results back if something went wrong. And that goes ahead and calls display results, passing the reason why things failed. In basic idea, we use a display handler. That's basically how data gets back from the asynchronous service back to the client side, and then we get it to run in the main thread. Here's the constructor, which takes the activity and makes a weak reference from it, and then it goes ahead and connects up the generic service connection for both the synchronous and asynchronous versions of all this stuff. 
Here's bind service. When bind service gets called, it checks to make sure that we've got the connection in place. And if so, we go ahead and call bind service using the application context. This is very important. We need to use the application context, not the activity context, because the activity context can come and go as the activity gets destroyed, but the application context lives longer. Um, this, of course, will go and get an intent to the weather service sync service, and it'll pass this connection to it. And uh, that's how it goes ahead and, and binds. And that will, of course, do the various callbacks to the, the M service connection sync object. Same thing works for the async stuff, basically the same idea, very canonical code. Here's unbind service. Unbind service is a little bit more clever. If the reason that unbind service is called is because we're changing configurations, then we just ignore the request to unbind the service. So the service is not unbound when the phone rotates. It just, it's just a configuration change, so we don't unbind the service. If it's a, a different reason why it's, it's um, calling unbind, like because the activity is actually going away for real, then in that case, we go ahead and we unbind both the synchronous and asynchronous services. And notice once again, we use the application context to do all these different kinds of things. So it's uh, gonna work even if rotation changes occur. Here's the on configuration change hook method that just gives us the new activity, a weak reference to the new activity that was created when the phone was rotated. Here's the get, the get weather sync API, which takes a location. It goes ahead and gets the interface for the weather call, the two-way guy. Um, if that's all set and ready to go, we create a new async task that's going to map a string, which is the location, and going to return back a list of weather data. We keep track of the location we're trying to get the weather for. Here's the do in background method. This is going to run in the background thread. It goes ahead and it invokes the two-way get current weather call passing in the location, and it invokes it, of course, on the proxy. And uh, that will then run in the background thread managed by the async task. And when that thread is finished, then the on post execute method gets called back. And this runs in the UI thread, of course, and that goes ahead and displays the results. It calls the display results method on the activity, passing back what happened. And um, it, so it gives back the weather data list if all went well, and it also gives back an error message to print if something's failed. Here's the execute method that gets called with the location that's used to kick off the async task. Here's the get weather async call. This does not have to run in a separate thread because it, it doesn't uh, actually uh, block. It just goes ahead and gets the proxy to the weather request object, and if it gets that properly, it calls the one-way get current weather call, passing in the location and passing in the callback object for the weather results. So that's basically how that works. The only exception you'll get here is a remote exception if there's no way to get to the service, but there are no other exceptions that will come back. That's, so that's basically the client-side logic for all this stuff. Now let's go take a look at the services implementation. This is where there's some pretty cool stuff going on. Um, and we'll also need to be able to look at the utils classes to figure out how this works. At the core of this thing is something called weather services or weather service base, which implements lifecycle logging service. So it automatically logged its lifecycle operations. Weather service base, as the name implies, is actually going to be used by both weather service sync and weather service async. And we'll see how that works in just a second. Here's the URL that we're going to use to make requests to the open weather service itself. And uh, we also have a cache with, that has a default timeout of 10 seconds. As I say in the comments, in a production application, you'd want the cache to be a lot higher, probably more like 10 minutes, which is what they recommend with the open web service API. But uh, to help with testing, we just make it 10 seconds. Otherwise, you'd have a lot of time wasting just waiting for the cache to be um, invalidated. We also then create something called weather cache, which extends something else called executor service timeout cache. And we'll go and look at the timeout cache here in a second. The timeout cache is really cool, and it basically maps the location to a list of weather data. 
The on create method and the on destroy method, these are both inherited by the Weather Service Sync and the Weather Service Async classes. And they do some really cool stuff using another really cool utility that is called generic singleton. And what we're doing here is we're basically sharing a single cache for both the synchronous and asynchronous services. They're both running in the same process, so we're going to share them between the two services. And in order to make the sharing easy, we use a singleton to share it. And in order to be able to make the singleton easy, we use something called the generic singleton. And we'll look at that implementation in a second. But the generic singleton will make sure that there's only ever one instance of the weather cache class. And it'll return that one and only instance. And it also goes ahead and once we get that instance back, we increment a reference count when we create the uh, weather cache. And we decrement a reference count when the weather service is just when the weather service objects are destroyed. And this way we make sure that we don't actually get rid of the cache until both services have shut down. So if one service shuts down before the other, the cache will not actually go away until the second one gets shut down. And so we'll look at the generic singleton in a second. We'll look at the weather cache in a second, and we'll look at the ref counter stuff here as well. Here is the the workhorse method of the service. This is called get weather results. What this does is it comes along and it uses the singleton weather cache to try to find the cached list of weather data for a given location. If it finds it, it just goes ahead and returns it. So we're done. So if, it, if we find the item in the cache, we're, we're finished. If we don't find the item in the cache or because the item was stale, but more likely because we didn't find it, because if it's stale, it's taken out of the cache. We then go ahead and call another method called get results from weather service, and we'll look at that in a second. And assuming that that works properly, then we go ahead and put that those results that we got from the weather service into the cache under that name, the name that we looked up, for up to whatever the, ca the cache timeout is, which in this case is 10 seconds, but it could be longer if, if we wanted it. Um, and then, then we would go ahead and return the results. So that's basically how we try to get the weather results. And that's used by both the synchronous and asynchronous service implementations. Let's go take a look at what happens if we don't find it in the cache. If we don't find it in the cache, then we go ahead and create an array list of weather data and a list of JSON uh, weather. We go ahead and... Um, create ourselves a new URL that has the URL for the web service and an encoded location. We then go ahead and use that URL to open a connection to the, to the open weather server, open weather service web service. To get that, we go ahead and then, uh, once we open the connection, we then go ahead and get the input stream and we store that into an input stream object. Once we've got the weather, the, the stream of weather data, we then go ahead and create a new JSON parser. And now we're going to parse the JSON stream corresponding to the data that's coming back from the weather service. And we stick that into the JSON weathers, which is basically a list of weather, uh, JSON weather objects, the JSON weathers object. And uh, no matter what happens here, we go ahead and we'll um, shut down the connection once everything is finished. So if we made it this far, and all is well, we then check to see whether or not we got anything from the server, because we may not have gotten it. We may have looked something up that was incorrect. We may have looked up a city that didn't exist. But if we did get something that existed, we then go through the list of JSON weather objects, and we go ahead and convert each JSON weather object, which is the encoding that comes back from the web, from the web service, and we turn that into the weather data object, which is a parcelable. And then we add that to the return list. And they'll typically just be one, but we, we set this up so it'll work more generally if we were to use features of the weather service API that return a list of, of weather data. Now, you might ask the question, why do we have JSON weather and weather data? Why don't we just do, do this one time? And it certainly is possible to do that. But in my experience, for a JSON 
formatted uh, data object that is as complex as what's returned by the weather service, trying to do that parsing on the fly with a parsable is very complicated. And so we found it easier just to go ahead and build up a uh, JSON weather encoding and then convert that JSON encoded data to the parsable that's understood by, by Android's AIDL mechanism. So if all goes well, we return that. Otherwise, if things don't go well, it's because we got some kind of error and we print out the error message we got back in a logging statement and then we return null. And of course, there are other ways to do this, but this is just a way to return that information. Okay, so that's basically how, that's the hard lifting part of this whole thing. Let's now go take a look at the sync and async services, which are actually very simple once we've seen all the stuff in the base class. Weather service sync extends weather service base. Here's its make intent factory method that makes an explicit intent. Here's its on bind method, which returns the iBinder corresponding to the weather call impl object. Here is the weather call impl object. This, of course, is an implementation of the weather call stub. So we have to fill in the two-way get current weather method. And uh, note that when you have a two-way method in AIDL, that will actually run, every call to a two-way method will run in a separate thread. That's not the same semantics with a one-way method for some strange reason, which is very odd, but that's just the way Android works. We'll talk about that in a second when we talk about the async implementation. What we do here is we use the get weather results method we just looked at in the base class to get the list of weather data. And if we got something that we, we like, we go ahead and return that. And that's handled properly by the uh, marshaling and demarshaling mechanisms built into the proxy and stub by Android. If for some reason we don't get back a valid list of weather data, then we return a new zero sized array list. Um, so we create a new zero sized object and that indicates that the location was in, incorrect. So that's basically how we get the data back in that case. If we take a look at the async version, it's very similar. Uh, it also extends weather service base. It has a factory method. It has an on bind method that returns, of course, a different object. It returns the weather request impl, which is the one that's implemented here. This, as you recall, is a one-way method that takes a string and a callback object. Now, keep in mind that this one will not actually run in its own thread. So if for some reason we want to have every call to get weather run in its own thread of control, we could use something like the Java executor service to execute this logic in its own thread that we would spawn. So if you, if you really want to have each thing run separately, then you'll have to use the Java executor service or uh, just spawn a thread here in order to get that to work concurrently. That's just an Android quirk. We get the weather results. Once again, if everything goes well, we call the send results method on the callback, passing the results back. If things don't work properly, then we go ahead and we send the error message back here. And uh, so this will get called back to a different method on the callback object for errors as if things go well, in which case we have to get the result back. So you can kind of think of this design as a way of being able to send back uh, exceptional data or error data via a one-way mechanism. Okay, that's basically the weather service. Now let's go take a look at utils. There's some really fun stuff in here. Uh, some of the stuff we've looked at before, retain fragment manager. I'm not going to go through this again. We've talked about it many times now. It's just basically used to store the, uh, the weather ops objects so it re retains its state between reconfigurations. Let's take a look at the, uh, oh, and we've also talked about generic service connection, which uses Java reflection in order to be able to do the bind protocol properly. It's, we've also talked about that before, so we'll skip over that. Let's talk about the, the timeout cache. So the timeout cache that we implemented is defined by this interface. So we basically have a timeout cache that takes a key and a value as generic types. We have a get method, we have a put method, we have a remove method, and we have a size method. Those are the interface methods. And now we can define different implementations of this. Here's the one that I used in my program. This is called executor service timeout cache. You'll see why it's called that in a second. This extends something called ref counted and implements the timeout cache. 
Let's quickly take a look at ref counted. We use this because we need to reference count the cache because it's shared by multiple services and we use it as a singleton. The reference count mechanism has an atomic integer that it uses to atomically increment and decrement the reference count, even if it's called for multiple threads. Get ref count returns the current reference count. Increment ref count atomically increments the atomic integer. And decrement reference count decrements the reference count by one. And if it drops to zero, it calls the close hook. And the close hook is something that has to be implemented by whoever implements this uh, class, whoever, whoever subclasses from this abstract class. So let's go ahead and take a look at the executor service, which indeed does extend this class so it's automatically reference counted. And you saw how it got used over in the service, uh, the service base, the weather service base class. The implementation is extremely clever um, and extremely efficient. We use a concurrent hash map here. And that has some real marvelous properties that help make things super fast. We'll take a look at that in a second. We also use a scheduled executor service, which is basically an executor service that schedules things to execute on the passage of time. And we have a, a single thread that's going to run in the background to, to manage this. We define something called cache values. You can see that the concurrent hash map maps keys to cache values objects. And Cache values basically contains the value of the cache, such as the, the list of weather data, and a scheduled future. And you'll see how that gets used in a second. And so here's basically how it's set in the constructor. Here is the main put method. As you can see, the put method just turns around and calls put impl. Um, probably could get rid of put impl. We don't really need it. We, we used it earlier for some other purpose. But uh, put impl takes a key and a value and a timeout. And here's what it does. It goes ahead and it creates a new runnable, which when run will remove the key from the map. And keep in mind that a concurrent hash map is thread safe. So as a result, we don't have to worry about any locking. So when this gets called, it'll remove the key from the map. We then go ahead and we schedule with the executor service, clean up cache to run, 10 seconds or you know n seconds whatever timeout is in our case it's 10 seconds but it could be n it, it goes ahead and runs that number of seconds in the future and we get back a future from the schedule method and then we call the put method on the the uh, concurrent hash map so what we're going to do is we're going to put a new cache values object with the value which would be in this case a list of weather data the future that we got back here and we're going to stick that into the hash map with this key. And when we call put, it gives us back whatever value might have been there previously. And if there was a previous value, that means we'd already registered something, a timeout for that particular location before. So if we have a, a timeout registered, we go ahead and cancel that timeout because we just registered a new timeout for that value. So every time you look something up and put something in the cache, it's going to go ahead and recompute the timeout for the next period of time in the future. So this is cool because there's no locking that we have to do here. It's all handled by the, the concurrent hash map. Here's the put met or put method just calls put impl. Here's the get method. All get does is it goes and looks up in the cache and sees if there's anything under that location. And if there isn't, then we return null. If there is, we return the value that was actually there. And then remove just goes ahead and removes things from the cache and size just returns the current size. And close, when it gets called back, when the reference count drops to zero, shuts down the executor, the scheduled executor service. So that's basically the logic we use for the timeout cache. You can see it's really concise, very clean, no extra locking. Does, it uses the hash map, the concurrent hash maps logic to do most of the heavy lifting there. Let's take a look at a couple other fun things here. Uh, here is generic singleton. So this is a super duper clever implementation of singleton. Singleton, generic singletons in Java are inherently hard to do because of limitations with the way that generics work. So this is a way to work around this. So we have a generic singleton that has a single field that's static called, or it has a single single static field called S instance, which is the one and only instance of the singleton. 
We then have a hash map, which maps class to object. And you'll see how this gets used in a second. Then we have a generic instance method that takes a class object. So this is the class that we're using. So that would be, for example, the class of the weather cache. We synchronize on S instance, which is static. So there's only one thread allowed at a time. We go and look up in the map and see if there's anybody who's already got a singleton for this particular cache. So we get back the result of this. If there is no entry here, this means it's the first time in. So we go ahead and we use class of, which of course is a class object, to make a new instance of that class. So in the case of the weather cache, we've just made a new weather cache object. And then we go ahead and we store this into the hash map. We store the new object, such as a weather cache object, in the hash map under the class uh, type itself. So weather cache will now have one and only one object. Um, if we already found it, of course, then we don't do any of this logic, and we simply, in either case, return the one and only instance of class that was stored in the singleton. And here are a couple of uh, other little tricks just to make sure there's only one of these things. We disallow instantiation and disallow cloning. So this is a kind of a clever way of being able to make a generic singleton in Java. And as far as I can tell, it's about the only way to make a generic singleton in Java. Last piece of the puzzle here is the utils class. And this just has some helper methods for things like formatting the temperature to con convert Kelvin to Fahrenheit and convert uh, Kelvin to Celsius. It's got a way to format the current date in a way that we'd like. It's got a way to format the current time in a way that we'd like. It's got a way of formatting the wind to indicate the direction that the wind is going. It's got a way to be able to generate the the particular art that we want depending on the weather condition. So depending on what kind of weather we have, we create different kind of uh, icon that we want to show rain or snow or um, clear or whatever. And uh, so that's basically it. That's, that's the utils class. Okay. So that was my implementation. I went by it pretty fast, but you're welcome, to, of course, to go back once we made the video for this thing and watch it at your leisure. So let's now go ahead and take questions because there's a bunch of questions that came in. Question number one, the on destroy method is not guaranteed to be called. So is it wise to unbind the service in there? Actually, uh, whether, or not, uh, the un whether or not the on destroy method is called, if you read the Android documentation and you look at the source code, you'll see that when an activity is is shut down, the, uh, the service is unbound automatically, whether or not uh, you call unbind service in on destroy. So there's actually no problem at all in doing that. Uh, let's see, using your paradigm, if your app uses multiple layouts requiring multiple layout fragments, would the activity manage all of its fragments with one retain fragment manager? Also, would each activity need its own retain fragment manager? There's, Jill, there's obviously many, many, many different ways to do this. Um, you could have your own, you could have each fragment have its own fragment manager. You could have, in the case of the retain fragment manager, it'll support multiple fragments. It'll manage multiple fragments if that's what you want to do. Um, I typically have been doing things in a way where every activity has its own retain fragment manager. That's what we've been doing. But if you have multiple fragments, it'll work just nicely as well. But obviously there's other options and I wouldn't want to uh, overly constrain anybody's creativity to do it in, in other ways if they so saw fit. Um, input, if the previous future expires in the tiny instance before you cancel it, then wipes out the replacement entry you just put in. Um, let's see, so, so there's a bunch of things. Um, I did this in, in a clever way so I didn't have to do any locking. I didn't want to have any additional locking. So I was just using the lock operation that was defined by the, the concurrent hash map. There are, of course, a number of subtle race conditions, although none of them are problematic. Um, there's obviously the race condition that could occur if you had an, an activity that could generate lookups at the site at the same time concurrently we, we don't support that with our current activity but you could have one that did it like that where you would end up uh, having the cache be empty and you'd end up allowing multiple requests to go through 
And of course, only one of them would ever be stored, but you know, it, it wouldn't be a, an ironclad, super duper guaranteed to be atomic cash. When I kind of thought about it, you know, going to the service every once in a blue moon in order to be able to, to, to the web service, in order to download something uh, on some strange race condition is really not a problem. It's, everything's going to work just fine. It's not like the code is not going to work. It's just every once in a strange while, you might do an extra remote call. And that, that seemed worth it relative to the complexity of trying to add all kinds of additional locks. So yeah, there there might be a few extra things there, but um, uh, I think it's probably fine the way it works now. Okay, uh, let's see. Worked with an old version of weather data and didn't check the. So you should be fine to use the old version, no problem. That's not a problem. Uh, let's see. Suppose the cache stores ten locations in ten different times. But if the cache time expires, all the location data will be removed. Um, no, no, we only remove the, the, the way the, if you go back and watch the video, you'll see that the cache is only removing one item. So every time you store a location in the cache that's a new location, then it's going to go ahead and, um, and register it to be, to be cleaned up. So it, it doesn't do it uh, every time. And it won't, it won't expire all the data every time. It only expires the one thing that is uh, being registered. Let's see. Weather may be thought of as a set of predictable field ranges. Maybe the weather could be computed locally based on some AI. Um, yeah, you could. I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure there's other ways to do weather computation. That was not at all the purpose of this assignment, but if you want to play around with that, it sounds cool. Um, what's the impact of your singleton cache if your service is run in two different processes? Well, obviously, then we're going to have a separate cache per process. There's nothing fancy we can do with our current implementation. For the implementation we'll do when we do the, the next uh, MOOC, where we're going to use basically an SQLite database and a content provider, then you could, in fact, have the cache shared between separate services. So that's no problem doing that. In fact, you could even do it now if you wanted to have the cache implemented in a separate service, which is also fine. I think some people are doing it that way. Um, but uh, the current solution isn't trying to do that, but you could. Is, is checking for is changing configurations a recommended method for dealing with bind and unbind? Um, it's all up to you. You can do it any way you want. I want it to be able to keep the service running as long as possible because it conceivably is doing some fairly long duration operations by downloading and uh, parsing all of the data that's coming from the weather service. That, that's a fairly large amount of data, as you've no doubt noticed if you had to write the code. So I didn't want to have to stop the service every time a person happened to reconfigure the orientation of the phone. That seemed pretty, pretty gratuitously wasteful to me uh, for this particular assignment. That's not to say, however, that there couldn't be other situations where you might want to stop the service. You might want to put the, the uh, unbind service, say, in the on stop call instead of on destroy. You might want to not check is changing configurations and have it shut down every time that you reorient the phone. Totally up to you. So you know, feel free to do it any way you want. I had a particular reason for doing it this way that I think is defensible from a design point of view, but uh, you are under no obligation to do it that way, and you're certainly under no obligation to do it that way in any other program you happen to write at any other time. Um, is JSON Reader an overkill for this application? Uh, you can certainly use JSON Object and JSON Array. I've actually got implementations that use that. I happen to use JSON uh, Reader just because I hadn't done that before and I wanted to get some experience with it, but you're welcome to use whatever it is that you happen to like. So there's no, there's no uh, constraints whatsoever. Can this video be downloaded from somewhere? Well, uh, as anybody who's ever watched a live lesson knows by this point, or a virtual office hour knows by this point, these things are immediately uploaded to YouTube in their raw form. So that should happen in the next, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And then I download them and I post-produce the video at a, at a more pleasant background, slice things up to have the 
Q&A section separate from the code walkthrough, et cetera. And then, of course, you can go and download those things from the course website later today. Um, I'm surprised you're asking that question because we've been doing this now for basically five weeks, and it's always been exactly the same. Um, how does the cache data survive configuration changes? The cache data uh, survives configuration changes because the service is never affected in any way, shape, or form when we orient, reorient the phone because we never unbind the service when an orientation change occurs. If you go back and look at the call in weather ops impl and you look at the unbind service method that's defined in weather ops impl, you'll see it checks to see whether or not the reason why the unbind request is being called is because we're in the middle of a configuration change. And if we're in the middle of a configuration change, it doesn't unbind from the service. So that means the service will continue to run in the background, in a background thread provided by the pool of threads that's provided by the Android binder framework. And so the services remain blissfully unaware that reconfigurations are taking place at all. So uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Is there a good standard way to keep the service alive for a short time after all clients unbind to make it easier to deal with configuration changes? Well, <laughs> That's what we just looked at. So uh, I just showed you how to do that. This implementation shows precisely how to keep the service running when reconfiguration changes occur. There, of course, are other ways to make the service continue running even above and beyond configuration changes. If you want to have a bound service that lives when the activity itself is destroyed, then you also go ahead and simply implement it as a so-called hybrid service, which overrides the on start command method. And that's described, of course, in earlier videos in the class on the hybrid services that we talked about. I would not recommend doing that, though, because then you've got to figure out how to shut down the service later, which is um, very complicated unless you really know what you're doing or unless there's a good reason why you want the service to run indefinitely. There are examples of this, and if you watch the videos, they'll talk about them, such as the music player service. If the web service API changes at some future time, is there a way to negotiate with the web service to know what the fields are and set the JSON parser? Um, I don't think that that's something you can do easily without a heck of a lot of additional features being built into the web service. So you probably simply would have to reread the, uh, the web service documentation and, uh, and hopefully they will be kind enough to make it clear that things have changed. This is a somewhat of a problem if you don't have version numbers in the data that comes back from a web service, and it does not appear that the Open Web Service, uh, open, open Weather Service API has version numbers. Maybe there's a way to get the version numbers, but it wasn't coming back by default. So uh, that, of course, is is something you'd have to take up with your web service uh, provider and argue with them as to why they should do that. Um, can the background service access the activity preferences cache? I'm not quite sure what you mean by the activity preferences cache. I assume you're talking about shared preferences. And yes, of course, you can certainly use shared preferences. No problem with that. Um, that turned out not to be very good for this particular assignment because the data structures that could be stored in shared preferences are very simple. And they won't store, say, a list of weather data. So it's an awful lot of complexity uh, to, to manage using shared preferences. And it's really overkill for this particular assignment. But it's possible to use them from services, yes. Uh, there was mentioned somewhere that a call to services were handled in a pool of background threads. So this is discussed if you go back and you watch the video on AIDL and the binder framework, I believe part two. It talks about the various uses of thread pools with the binder. And in a nutshell, every a process has a pool of threads, and I think the number is something like 16 by default, although you may be able to change that, and that may change over time with Android. There may be an options field you can use to change that, a preferences field, for example. And um, for two-way calls, then each call is run in its own thread in that pool up to the point where you reach 16 of them, or N, where N is the max, at which point then those calls will be buffered until the thread becomes available. For one-way calls, it appears as if only a single thread in the pool is used to handle one-way calls. Don't blame me for these semantics. These are Google semantics. Go blame uh, Diane Hackborn as to why things are strange like this. 
So as I was saying when I was walking through my code, if you were in a situation where you wanted to have the one-way calls for the, the async service run in a pool of threads, then in that situation, you would have to spawn those threads yourself using some kind of scheduled, uh, some kind of executor service or spawn a thread with a Java thread or, or whatever you want to use to get threads to run. So that's basically just some of the inconsistencies in the way in which uh, Android works. And those are discussed in the earlier video on AIDL and the binder framework. OK, well, I think we've basically come up against the end of the hour here. And uh, if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to take them. Otherwise, if you wait a short time, well, you, if you wait a short time, you can get the, the raw video of all this. If you wait a slightly longer time uh, later today, you will get the, the uh, post-processed version of this video that looks nicer. But uh, I thank you guys very much for coming. Hopefully, this will help with reviewing people's code for assignment number three. And uh, as always, please don't hesitate to ask questions on the discussion forum. Thanks very much.